Can you hear me? Is that working? Cool. Hello, chaps. It's half past two. Welcome to the, how do you pronounce it? Hypatia, Hypatia stage. Um, I'm Charles Armstrong. Uh, that's interesting. I'm Charles Armstrong. I'm an entrepreneur uh, from London. And I'm going to be talking about ways to succeed with a startup at a time when uh, the economy is shaking and a lot of things are changing in the world. So just to kind of get a sense of uh, what stage people are at in the audience. How many people are already involved in a, in a startup or in, in a venture? Put your hand up. And how many of you are thinking that within the next 12 months you might set up a venture? Yeah, go on. You, sh you should do it. You should do it. And how many of you are, are anxious about the the condition of the, the world's economy at the moment and what that might mean for, for, your, for your work. It's, it's a strange time. So first I should just say that this isn't quite the, the session that was advertised. Uh, I was going to talk uh, specifically about co-working spaces and ways that you can use them to accelerate the development of a venture, but just speaking to people here over the last few days, it's clear that a lot of people are concerned about uh, the economy, uh, and so I wanted to broaden out the subject to, to really focus on that. So a little bit about my background. Um, I'm a sociologist. I, I studied at St. John's College, Cambridge, um, and then I'm, I'm responsible for, for three startups at the moment. Uh, the first one I founded is called Trampoline Systems. That's a software business in London uh, that specializes in large-scale social network analysis. Uh, we're doing work for uh, many large corporations. Uh, we've also launched a couple of projects uh, analyzing business communities in East London and, and in Cambridge. Secondly, the Trampery, which is uh, a shared workspace business uh, in London uh, that opened in 2009. Uh, I'll be talking a bit more about that during the presentation, but uh, we're currently opening a network of, of spaces in London. And finally, One Click Orgs, uh, which is a non-profit and which is providing electronic, electronic systems uh, to help it make it easier to set up uh, corporations and non-profits uh, and to involve lots of people in, in decision making. And finally, for the last 18 months or so, I've been working a bit with uh, the Prime Minister's office in London on their Tech City initiative, helping to grow uh, the community of, of, of businesses in, in East London. So over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, a fairly established recipe has emerged. Uh, in, it originated really in the States, but now has become obviously very influential uh, in Europe and around the world as well for the route that you follow to take uh, an, an innovative idea and develop a successful startup. And these are some of the main elements that you expect to see in that recipe. Uh, that like, everybody aspires to raise investment from a famous venture capital business. And probably uh, the, the big Silicon Valley firms are the ones that, that carry the most status. But now there's a good spread of, of large and niche uh, European venture capital firms that also carry a big cachet. And those firms hold incredible sway over the minds of entrepreneurs, for, for right or wrong. I don't want to say if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but like, that's a very, very strong part of the aspirational ideology that surrounds startups at the moment. Secondly, an emphasis on scaling. Uh, the idea that whatever, idea, whatever, whatever innovation you have, whatever market or field you're in, then it's your duty uh, to, to expand that as rapidly as you possibly can. To, to go from something that might be operating successfully at a small scale in a local market to something that's operating in, in multiple markets uh, is diversifying across different, different sectors. Thirdly, um, a very specific idea of what entrepreneurs should look like and how they should communicate and the kind of language they should use. And, and a lot of that is is borrowed from the way that large corporations communicate. So there's this, this subtle cultural package 
uh, of how a startup is meant to behave, and particularly the founders, how they're meant to behave. Um, fourthly, the office. The office is a kind of symbol of your success, that, that you're meant to have uh, uh, ideally a, like a, a gleaming, uh, highly designed uh, place with a reception that somebody will come into, a customer will come into, and they'll be wowed by, by what that looks like. Um, and then finally, the idea that, that as there are different functions that you need to make your business work, you should employ people and you should build up your own team covering everything from development to sales to human resources to marketing and, and that should be your personal army or your, your own corporate army that's fighting the battle. So that is the standard recipe for how you build a successful startup and the advice I'm going to give you today is, is really to forget almost every element in that uh, in that recipe because that might have been a good recipe for the boom years but in a climate where almost every element of the economy is in question or changing in some way there are significant risks and, and, and drawbacks with, with most of the elements in that recipe. So we're in the the later stage of a banking crisis and the middle stage of a sovereign wealth crisis. Unemployment in most of our societies is rising. Investment by large corporations is shrinking. Um, and at the same time, we have crises around energy and, and climate change. Like you, can, you can hardly put your finger on any element of our economic and social and political and corporate systems that is really solid at the moment. This is a very, very remarkable period. And it shouldn't be a surprise that the kind of tactics and strategies that are going to be successful in an environment like that are going to be different than the normal rules. So whenever there's, there's a, an, an untested or a new situation, uh, it's, al it's always instructive to look back at history and try and find parallels because there's actually hardly anything completely new that we encounter. Anything that appears new there's usually one or other historical precedent that we can find that gives us clues about what strategies are going to be successful. And in this case, I think you have to look back quite a long way. In fact, I think you have to look back 65 and a half million years uh, because something quite extraordinary happened to the world at that point. That, that, uh, it, was like, it was like a 1970s Hollywood disaster epic. Uh, it, it looks very likely that uh, a substantial meteorite hit the planet, but it also looks as though uh, there was a, 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 an increase in volcanic activity that was completely unconnected. There was, there was a whole series of cataclysmic changes that occurred um, and triggered uh, what is referred to as the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. Got the point. Um, and this led to 70% of the species that were living on Earth being wiped out over a relatively short period. Um, and that meant that entire food chains and ecosystems collapsed, that all of the normal rules, they stopped working. And as, as we all know, that meant that the dominant species uh, who had occupied the planet for, 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 for millions of years, they were completely wiped out. And it meant that previously marginal uh, species, uh, notably mammals, suddenly exploded and had an opportunity to grow in a way that had never been possible before. So what can we learn from that? Why did the small mammals survive? Well, for one thing, the fact that they were small turned out to be the biggest advantage they had. They didn't need a lot of resources to survive. Uh, and so in a situation where everything was collapsing, they were able to scavenge, they were able to make do with what there was. Secondly, with the downfall of the dinosaurs, their main predators had vanished. Uh, so suddenly, they were free to expand uh, without the threats they'd had before. Thirdly, they were able to evolve rapidly. So after the, the extinction episode, mammals went through uh, a succession of really dramatic changes that they developed much more sensitive hearing and sense of smell, which meant they were able to hunt food more effectively. They, they developed fur and ways of managing their body temperature, which meant that they could survive in a world which was a lot colder and more arid. They could preserve water as well as warmth. So those three factors 
being small as an advantage. Secondly, uh, the threat of the bigger predators being reduced. And thirdly, the ability to be agile, to adapt and evolve. Those are very, very good uh, evolutionary characteristics in a time of giant crisis. And those are all three advantages that a startup can have. And those are really what, what we need to, 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 to major on to, to succeed. So here are the lessons that in a, in a, in a, in a large scale crisis, the rules can change completely from one generation to the next generation. Secondly, being small and agile is the best winning strategy. And thirdly, the creatures that survive the catastrophe, uh, they can go on to become the dominant species. So that's a really interesting uh, reason to be an entrepreneur right now. So I'm going to talk about uh, four different topics which are central to the life of a startup and look at what the new strategies might be in those areas. So first of all, finance. Uh, that's something that is obviously key to any, any venture. So this is a quote from a report uh, that was put out by the Kaufman Foundation in the United States in 2009 that was, was not widely accepted at the time. Uh, they predicted that the total funds managed by venture capitalists would contract by 50% uh, from, from $24 billion to, to $12 billion. Uh, and that's specifically referring to the United States. But a lot of the VC industry, they said, no, no, that's ridiculous. This is just the cyclic change. We're going to come back. We'll be at the same level as we were. So here, here are the facts. Uh, and this is looking at worldwide figures rather than just the US now. But there's actually been, from 2008, which was the peak, until 2011, which is the last year for which figures were available, there's been a 75% reduction in the total amount of money being invested by venture capital. And, and that might recover a bit in, in the next few years. But any idea that that's going back to the level where it was is, is really, really extremely unlikely. So in a climate like this, should we be looking to venture capital as the primary source of finance for our businesses? And I think really the answer has to be no. Um, because at the same time as the total amount of venture capital is reducing so dramatically, the way it's being allocated is changing as well. So in, in a hostile climate, venture capital firms become much more concerned about supporting the businesses that they've already made investments in. So they're, they're diverting more of the funds away from new investments to supporting their existing portfolio. Secondly, they're doing a smaller number of deals, but the deals are larger, because that's a less risky thing to do most of the time. And thirdly, they're investing in businesses which are already either profitable or closer to profitability, because again, that's a, a way to reduce risk. So the overall reduction in, in, in the amount of money in venture capital combined with these factors makes it even less likely that any specific startup is going to be able to attract venture capital. So that's broadly the way, the conventional way uh, a startup would look to raise money to different rounds. You'd start off raising uh, perhaps uh, a few tens of thousands of, of euros from, from, from friends and family. Once you'd, you'd established a prototype, perhaps, you'd move on to raise a larger amount from angel investors. Uh, and, and once you'd got a few customers and had demonstrated the value of your, your product, you might raise money from venture capital. And that would really take you through this whole range from, from, from perhaps half a million euros up to, uh, up to several million euros. And after that, uh, you would have private equity and uh, IPOs as, as, as the route to raise more money than that. If you compare that with what looks like the picture now, friends and family and angel investment have remained broadly the same. Private equity is coming down into uh, smaller deals, and that's a very interesting trend. But it's, venture capital is moving up. The, the, the deals below 2 million euros now are very, very rare uh, compared to how they were four years ago. And so you have this big gap uh, if you want to raise money uh, between perhaps a few hundred thousand euros up to a few million euros, how are you going to raise it? And that, that's a, a very important growth stage for a lot of 
businesses. So I think we're, we're in the early stage of seeing incredible innovation in venture finance. Uh, and crowdfunding is really a central element in this. How many of you are familiar with, with crowdfunding? Cool. And if I'd asked that question three years ago, it would, it, would, it would probably have been one or two people in the audience. It's really very heartening how rapidly that has risen to prominence as a legitimate, viable financing route. Uh, and there are really three different characteristic varieties of crowdfunding uh, that businesses are using. The one that got established earliest is, is a kind of donation, or almost philanthropic crowdfunding. Uh, and Kickstarter uh, was the first uh, platform that really enabled that to scale. And obviously, they're, they're getting a lot of publicity at the moment. Uh, they're doing multi-million dollar deals on Kickstarter. Uh, and those are typically situations where somebody providing uh, some money, they, they might get a copy of a, a product in return, or they might get a, a, an autographed book, or they might get attendance at the premiere of a film. But they're not going to get a cash reward in most cases from, from their investment. So that's, that's, that's kind of appropriate for certain kinds of projects, typically uh, arts projects, charitable projects. It's less appropriate for, uh, for commercial ventures. So secondly, club-based crowdfunding. So this, this first got established in the film industry and in the music industry as a way for artists to remain independent from uh, big studios, a way to raise money essentially from their fans that would enable them to record and produce and market an album or a film uh, without needing to sacrifice their independence. And in this model, uh, anybody who's putting in, in money, they become a member of a club uh, and then if the product becomes commercially successful, they have a right to receive some of the proceeds uh, from that. But they're not actually earning equity in anything. So it's, it's a legally simple form of crowdfunding. Thirdly, equity crowdfunding. And this is the, the, the most recent uh, arrival. It's only in the last year that uh, platforms like Crowdcube and Cedars uh, have really managed to clear the legal and regulatory barriers to offering the service. Uh, but this is probably the most important model for startups uh, because it, it is essentially like an angel investment round that people who are investing money are actually gaining equity in your business but it enables you to do it in a way that you could have a hundred or five hundred investors rather than just five or six um, and that's a, a very very powerful route so out of the people who is there anybody here who's raised money through crowdfunding to date anybody who's who's considering that option and could, could I ask one of you to, have you, have you got a microphone actually? Sorry, could... Hello? Hello, if you could introduce yourself and just tell us a bit about what you might raise crowdfunding for. Okay, uh, my name is Jan, uh, I'm from Czech Republic and uh, the idea what I would like to crowdfund is actually very, uh, it's the database of Czech companies uh, connected with many resources from Czech courts, uh, Twitter, Facebook, to uh, put all the uh, data about uh, companies together especially in the Czech Republic, in order to open the really, in order to get all the Czech companies naked. And the reason why I would like to crowdfund it uh, is that I like the idea that you don't have uh, four or five funders, but actually you have thousands of funders, and they all support you. They have all Twitter accounts, they have all Facebook accounts, and in one moment, you have big movement, whether they, they, if they support you, to, to push the idea forward. And that, that's the why. Fantastic. And how much are you looking to raise with that, do you think? Uh, hopefully. It's like Czech Republic is, as a post-communic country, is, uh, there is very difficult with all the um, legal stuff. I mean, it's, you need to have a share, com um, share company in order to dilute all the stuff. Because if you have a limited uh, liability company, you're not allowed to uh, give less than 10%. So you need to really go for the highest level of, uh, of hierarchy. And I guess it would be possible to raise about 40,000 euros, what I cool. expect.
But good luck with that. And the lady behind it, you can tell us a bit about your project. My name is Angelica and I'm, um, I'm looking for money uh, to do a prototype for an, uh, a bag for an umbrella that's waterproof, a design product. And I'm doing a competition with uh, Gründer Garage who, who's um, working with Google and uh, with Indiegogo. And at the moment I'm, I'm nominated with another uh, idea, but I'm uh, preparing the campaign for Indiegogo at the moment. And how much do you, do you want to raise? Uh, I need just money for, um, I have a, um, a partner already who's doing the prototype and producing the thing. So I need money for the um, patent and for a solicitor and do some marketing activities. Uh, so I'm raising just 5,000 uh, euro with this. Fantastic. Well, very good luck with that. So you've seen some great examples of the way that you can use crowdfunding to advance an initiative that maybe five years ago people would have looked to either a bank or to a venture capitalist to fund. And as those resources disappear, we've got new, new ways to fund that. So the final um, option is, is one that I want to stress because it's not so prominent at the moment. But actually, there are all kinds of innovations available with loan-based finance. So particularly if you've got a business where you need, you, you need capital at the beginning uh, and then you're expecting to generate revenue quite quickly, you don't really want to give away ownership and equity in that. And, and loan-based models can be very, very good for that. So if you, uh, if you, you can essentially crowdfund a loan uh, so that you can have a number of people loaning you money that is secured on the, either on the equity of the company or on an, an asset like a patent. Uh, and that gives you a way to raise finance and you pay interest to those, those people. So they get a commercial benefit, but you don't have to dilute your ownership of the company. So I think there's going to be a lot more, ownership, a lot more innovation around bonds and uh, debentures and loan-based models as well as the, the equity crowdfunding model. But before you go down any of those routes, like the question that every single one of us needs to ask is, do we really need investment? Because there's still a, a kind of lingering uh, machismo about raising investment. And it kind of shows, yes, I'm a real entrepreneur. I've raised a few million dollars. But if there's a way that you can grow your business and get your idea to market without raising any capital, then in a climate like this, that's really what we should do because that creates the minimum risk. That means that from the beginning, we're supporting what we're doing by earning income from the market. It's also the best way to validate an idea. You're asking people to pay for something right from the beginning. And there are a number of ways, whatever your idea or product is, there are often ways that you can twist it to get some money in early on. So a classic one is consulting. That, that in order to build any product uh, or service, you, you become a specialist in that. And that knowledge that you gain by becoming a specialist, the chances are there are some businesses out there in the world who are willing to pay you for that expertise that you have and the innovative ideas that you have. And so consulting is a great way to generate money early on in the development of a business. Secondly, if you've got a product or service uh, that is of interest to uh, perhaps a, a corporate provider or another business, if there's a way that you can disguise it under their branding or hide it under, under their existing products, that can be a way to generate licensing revenue as well. Uh, thirdly, corporate sponsorship. Like, as, as, as conventional advertising uh, becomes less effective, uh, uh, there are a lot of brands that are looking for innovative ways to, to target particular audiences and get their message out to, to, to potential customers. If there's a way that you can spin off something from your product or service, uh, that then you can create something that you can raise sponsorship for, that can actually be a really good way to get money into a venture early on. So think very hard if there's a way that you can finance what you want to do without ever raising capital. So just a little bit about my experience in this regard. So I started off um, pretty much on a, on a conventional route. My first software business, Trampoline Systems, uh, I, I raised the friends and family round, I raised the seed round, and then in 2007, I raised three million uh, pounds, that was six million dollars at the time, 
uh, from uh, a US-based VC fund. Uh, and, and like the business was all set off to, to go down the conventional track. And then 2008, uh, the markets collapsed and that VC firm completely pulled out of the market. Um, so really that's the point that I started looking at innovative routes. And, and in 2009, um, my business Trampoline Systems uh, was one of the world's first technology companies to raise finance through equity crowdfunding. And like all, of, all of our solicitors told us at the time that what we wanted to do was impossible and we'd go to prison. So I, I, just, I just kind of carried on until I found a lawyer uh, who was curious about the idea and was willing to work with me to find a way to get around all of the regulations. And, and we, we successfully raised half a million pounds um, uh, in 2009, uh, and that enabled the business to, to continue and, and to grow. Right now, uh, for, for another business, uh, my workspace business, we're raising uh, a half million pound bond, uh, which is very much as I described, that we're, it's actually on a property that we need to spend a lot of money refurbishing. So we're getting private investors to put in the money uh, at the beginning, which we will then repay over five years. We'll pay a good high rate of interest to them. Uh, so they get a good return. That will be secured on the lease for the building. So I'm not having to dilute the company. It's paying for the refurbishment so that we can start generating money from it. All of the investors will get uh, a good return for it, and it's, it's a low risk to them. Uh, if that's successful, then next year I'm actually planning a much larger bond that would be crowdfunded potentially across 100 investors. So a loan-based mechanism combined with crowdfunding. And I think if that's successful, that opens up a lot of possibilities. So, 10% per annum. So that's a good rate. <laughs> and if you look, if you, you might have come across uh, Zopa, which is a peer-to-peer -peer lending mechanism. So for smaller sums, there's already a platform where you can try and raise, raise money. That doesn't work so well for, for bigger, bigger sums. So the main lessons, bootstrap your company if you possibly can. If you can find a way to avoid raising money, it's the best way to work in an environment like this. Secondly, Look at innovative mechanisms like crowdfunding or bond finance if you really need cash. Thirdly, don't be scared to innovate. Uh, like finance can be an intimidating thing. It's got its own language, its own rules. Uh, but if you're like any entrepreneur, once you understand the fundamentals, if you can start thinking of different ways to organize it, if you can find a lawyer that understands what you want to do, then chances are you can invent a new way of raising finance. And this is a great time to be trying to do that because across Europe, regulations are being liberalized on, on a lot of these, these kind of investments. And, and finally, I don't want to sound like I'm negative on venture capitalists. Like really, really good venture capitalists are still very, very valuable allies to have. And for certain kinds of business that need to expand in a certain kind of way and that are looking for particular kinds of, of exits, uh, a venture capital firm is a very, very good way to, to do that. So that's finance. Secondly, growth. Uh, that, that this would seem to be a straightforward thing. That like, surely, if you've got a startup, you want to grow as rapidly as possible. Well, I'm not sure that that's strictly true at the moment, uh, because there's a balance between the rate of growth and your resilience, your ability to survive changes in the environment. Uh, because when you're growing very rapidly, and you're having to maybe expand your team very rapidly, you're expanding your costs, uh, and you're entering markets that you might not be so familiar, you might not have such strong communities and networks, then it's like an army that's advancing very rapidly. It gets harder and harder for the supplies to get through because they're having to go further and further. So anything that changes in the environment that can lead to an increased risk of failure. So I don't want to, um, to, to go into to too much detail uh, about this, but um, like with, with my so first software business, Trampoline, uh, we were breaking even uh, quite early on in the company's existence with five people. We then raised venture capital and grew to 20 people just before the 2008 crisis hit and our venture capitalist departed. And we were left in a position that we were spending £100,000 a month. We didn't have anything like that level of income. Uh, and like, it took a lot of innovation on our part to stop the company collapsing at that point. 
Uh, we managed to do it through the crowdfunding and a kind of very carefully planned restructuring that got us back down to five people. But essentially I had to start growing trampoline uh, all over again from five people. And I've done it very differently the second time round, I tell you. So be very careful about growth. Like growth is what we're all here for. It's a great thing. But do it at a, at a rate and in a way that's planned so that you can survive any shocks that might come your way. So the lesson about growth, be, be mindful of that balance between resilience and your ability to survive shocks and the rate of growth that is expanding your market and bringing in more resources. Secondly, that means that you need to be ready to turn away some opportunities and even some opportunities that look brilliant. Uh, and, and like I've been practicing this in, in the, last, uh, the last few months, I've turned down opportunities to expand uh, my, my workspace business, the Trampery, into international territories because I think we need to concentrate on making it work across multiple sites in one city before we do that uh, so that we have a more resilient model. Thirdly, try to plan your growth in shorter steps so that at each step you become profitable at that level before moving on to the next step rather than trying to do giant growth steps where you might have to be in the larger market for several years before you're self-sustaining at that level. So the next thing is a, a subject dear to my heart is, uh, is, is business culture. And like this isn't something that gets talked about or written about uh, very much, but I think it's actually really, really important at the moment. Because as soon as you start getting involved with investors and, and lawyers and people in marketing, there are all kinds of subtle pressures for you to start behaving like a corporate person, uh, that, that you should start, you smarten yourself up, that you should wear a suit and tie, that you should use a language that sound, sounds like it comes out of Forbes magazine or The Economist. Um, and and there's, a, there's a kind of a sense that you're not going to get taken seriously unless you do this, that customers are not going to listen to you, that nobody's going to invest in your business unless you do this. Um, but there's a downside, because the more that you adopt this, this kind of persona, this artificial business persona, then the less of the passion and authenticity that makes you really love your business and that made you do it in the first place, the less that that's going to shine through. And in a time like this, it's that passion that is actually the most powerful thing that you have to convince other people to believe in you and support your venture. And another thing that I would observe, at a time when all of the rules are in question, it can really be an advantage to look different and sound different and be unique compared to everybody else. That if you go to, like this is a brilliant uh, uh, counter example today, but if you go to a, a, a typical business conference, you'll see a lot of grey suits. Uh, and the people who aren't wearing grey suits, they will really, really stand out. And those are the people that are going to be remembered. And that if, if somebody who was there sees you at another event in a few years' time, they'll remember you and they'll come up and talk to you. If you're wearing a grey suit, the chances that they're going to remember you are very, very small. So again, just from my experience, when I set up Trampoline Systems for the first couple of years, um, I was kind of, I'd never done a, a commercial startup before, uh, and I, I did the suit thing, and I tried to, to, to present myself that way. And after, after a couple of years, I realized it was just making me uh, really miserable in what I was doing. And, uh, and so I broke with that at that point. Um, and it was really at that point that, that things started taking off. And I have found that um, if you're yourself, if you just behave as yourself, uh, and you, you have the conviction, then even big corporate executives and government uh, officials uh, and investors, they don't care about that at all. They care about what you're saying and what your, what your product project is. Sorry, had a question? So the question is whether I raised the half million pounds crowdfunding uh, with, a, with a colorful clothing or with a suit. And it, it, was, it was with my colorful clothing. And, and like we got a lot of press coverage. We, the Financial Times did a big article about us. TechCrunch Global did a big article about us. And, and the fact that, that the kind of, I was quite a distinctive figure really helped to attract attention to what we were doing and to, to kind of position the story in a way that, that investors were intrigued by it. So it's, it's only been an advantage. Like I say, there is one journalist in London 
who, who constantly uh, attacks me for the way that I look. But other than that, everybody, everybody just seems to, to accept it and it's been a positive. <laughs> well, thank you. So, lessons for this section, be yourself, be yourself and let your passion, let your conviction for your project, let that communicate what you're doing and, and really respect convention so that if you're going to a meeting with, with, with some, some corporate people, then maybe dress a little bit more smartly, but do it in your way rather than a conventional way. So respect convention, don't follow it. And Focus on building genuine relationships. If there's, if there's a potential business person who you think isn't going to accept you if you're yourself, then ask yourself if you really want to be working with them. Because that, like, that should be an important question. Like, if you want to build a set of business relationships that are going to survive in a time of change, then they'd better be strong relationships where you're genuinely trusting each other, genuinely getting on with each other. And if somebody needs you to wear a suit before they'll do business with you, is that really somebody you want to trade with? So, fourthly, workspace. Subject dear to my heart. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, the conventional wisdom is, like, as an entrepreneur, you should be aiming to have your, your tower block, uh, your, your Trump Tower as the crowning achievement, a symbol of your success. And, and anything less than that is a compromise or is temporary. Like, particularly, it used to be the case that if you were in a shared office, uh, then that was really not saying something good about your business. That is changing completely and with very good reason. So, there's been a lot of discussion of co-working already at the conference. Like, how many people here are based in a shared workspace or a co-working space? Okay, that's about a third, a third of the people here. So how many, how many of you are in businesses that have their own offices that you're not sharing with anyone else? Hmm? Okay, understood. and how many of you don't have any office at all? Are you are you're in cafes, you're working in bedrooms, so forth? Yeah, that's a great place to start, that's the classic. Bedrooms and garages. Um, so a lot of the time when people talk about co-working, they, they, they think it's just about economical, saving money on your own office and the flexibility of just paying monthly. But actually it's a whole lot more than that. And I think co-working spaces are the breeding ground for completely new ways of growing a business. This is what I was originally going to talk about for the whole session. Um, so I think what you see happening now in co-working spaces is a kind of community approach to building ventures. Uh, that, that now that you have businesses that are with each other day by day, where the individual team members are starting to make friendships uh, with each other, uh, you're starting to see this complex, uh, organic uh, kind of business community. Just from my own experience with the Trampery, I'm seeing uh, businesses starting to treat the other businesses in the space almost as members of their own team. So that you ask for advice from any of the businesses there. You, you, you get introductions from any of the businesses there. You might even start um, subcontracting some of the businesses there. Um, the, I'm also seeing a trend that freelancers who come in and work for one business in a co-working space, very quickly they start working for another business and another business. And you have this pool of, of skilled people who aren't just associated with one business. They're kind of a resource that's connected to half of the, the, the community there. Um, now what's interesting about this is the balance between one business succeeding and the whole community succeeding is starting to shift. That, that there's a kind of even if one of the businesses fails, it's much more likely that the skilled team members can get employed by the other businesses there. So it, in, a, in a time of increased risk and uncertainty, this is looking to me like a very, very strong model, that it's taking away risk, it's introducing new elements uh, to help you succeed. So my experience, in 2009, I, I got interested in the potential for shared workspaces and I turned trampoline systems office into a co-working space called the Trampery. There was actually, like, how many of you have been to Shoreditch in East London? Yeah, well, the rest of you should come and visit, come and visit, it's a lovely place. Um, and I'm wearing my, my I love Hackney badge proudly today. Um, 
So it, we were the first shared workspace in, in Shoreditch, which was already a thriving center of innovation uh, in uh, fashion, in the visual arts, uh, and, and it was just the beginning of the time that there was a software industry there. We were one of the first software companies. So we opened our space, and almost overnight, uh, a lot of other businesses came in, uh, and then we expanded last year. We're, we're expanding uh, quite rapidly at the moment. So right now, about a third of the businesses working in the Trampery have partnered with at least five other businesses. And that, that's an extraordinary figure. So if you draw a graph, there's this dense web of interconnections. And there are, there are four or five freelancers now who are working for at least three companies there. So I'm really tracking this with a lot of interest because I think if we can scale that model, it presents a brilliant way of growing businesses and enabling skilled people to be associated with the businesses that are really successful from that. And I've actually reorganized Trampoline to take advantage of the way that the Trampery is now supporting it as an infrastructure. So I'll just show you the buildings that, that we're opening. That's the one that's open at the moment. We've got 60 people and two uh, meeting rooms. This is, this is kind of the key building on, on Old Street, which is the main road in Shoreditch. Uh, we're just starting to develop this now. That'll have space for 50 people, a large uh, a conference center, and, and a members club. This is one we're opening uh, out in Clerkenwell, a bit further to the west. Uh, it's more popular for the, for the media and advertising and marketing industry. We're gonna have 50 people there and a seminar room. Then a bit further east by London Fields, an area that's really popular for artists and graphic designers. We're gonna have 60 people there and a cafe and hopefully a performance uh, space as well. And then the biggest one, um, on Tabernacle Street, this will have space for 200 people, including some larger businesses alongside uh, the startups. Uh, we're going to have a winter garden, like a big glass meeting room, uh, and there's gonna be an event space there. So this, this, I'm focusing on scaling the trampery through East London and seeing if we can work out how to support a community of innovators and startups and link them up and see those benefits across uh, that network of spaces in one city before we take that model to other locations around the world. So just some pictures from the interior. As you can see, we, oh, this is actually, we, we, we hosted a dinner for, for Prince Andrew, uh, which was quite an exciting uh, occasion. And uh, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, uh, came to visit us at the Trampery last November uh, to mark the first year of uh, the government's Tech City initiative. And unlike his predecessor, he can actually use an iPad. I can, I can verify that personally. So, the lessons for workspace. Treat a workspace as a strategic choice, not just as a tactical short-term choice. If you find a community that fits you in terms of the, the culture and the philosophy and the mix of businesses there, then that is going to help you in a thousand ways. And you might not even be able to predict the ways that that's going to help you grow. Also, don't, don't go to a space which is all people doing the same thing as you. I've seen it be a real advantage to be in a diverse interdisciplinary community where you're surrounded by people in totally different fields because you can learn something from every one of those businesses and you can collaborate with them. So like one of the biggest surprises in the Trampery, we had an art gallery uh, based there um, and they still provide all of our artworks and, and rotating exhibitions. Their first, they, they, within a month, they were partnering with a mobile app development uh, business. And then they, were develop, they, they started collaborating with a non-profit doing education. Like, nobody would have predicted that. But because they were in the same space, they, they kind of met over coffee, they met at some of our social events, and they found that there were things they had in common that could, could help them advance their, their projects. Sorry, do we, can we have a microphone, actually? Thanks. Uh, Tess. Okay. Hey, yeah, um, about this strategic choice. Um, are you talking here about location or uh, what? Because, I mean, the strategic location, usually they are expensive, right? And for startups, we cannot afford it. Um, yeah, is this what you mean? Or do you have any um, suggestion or tips if the strategic location is really expensive? Thanks. Well, so, location is important, but, but I would say that actually the mix of 
uh, other businesses and the, in a way the culture and philosophy is more important. Uh, that if, if, if you choose a location that's a bit cheaper, that's maybe one kilometer away from the epicenter, but it's got a really, you feel comfortable there, you feel at home. That, like, it's, an, it's more of an instinctive thing than a rational thing, but if, if it feels right and you like the people that you meet there and there are one or two other businesses that you know are relevant to what you're doing, that's what I mean by strategic. Uh, if, like I'm, with, with the Trampery sites in London, the more central ones, they're more expensive than the ones that are a bit further out. But we're trying to connect those. So the businesses that can't afford to be in the really expensive ones, they can afford the space in the cheaper ones, but they gain drop-in access. Uh, so if you want to have a meeting with an investor at a kind of really, really central location, you can still do that. Because like, impressing investors and customers is still an important part of your office space. So you need to have somewhere that you're comfortable bringing people that you want to impress and convince about what you're doing. But I think that the exact location is less important than the other mix of people and, and whether you feel comfortable in that place and you like being there and you find it stimulating and inspiring. Um, so two final points on workspace. Make time for informal connections. Uh, like we're all super busy. We've got more tasks to do than we've got time. But if you can find five or 10 minutes in the day to just uh, have a sandwich uh, and in a place where you can chat with other people, that's where a lot of the, the value is actually created. And you couldn't plan it. So the last point, be open to random possibilities. Be open to serendipity, because that is the magic of shared workspaces. It's the, the unplanned, unexpected surprises. And you just need to be able to spot those and, and run with them, even if you don't know where it's going to lead. So wrap up. So if you're doing a startup in a time like this, avoid raising finance if you can bootstrap your business. If you need investment to get your business going, consider innovative routes like crowdfunding or bonds. Be very careful how quickly you grow. Make sure that you could survive shocks and, and still be, be resilient. Fourthly, is it one, two, three? Fourthly, be yourself. Don't feel that you need to pretend to be something different just to be in a startup. Don't. Fifth, find locations, whether they're co-working spaces or, or cafes or whatever, uh, where you can associate with people who can help you and build a community. And finally, be ready to outsource parts of what you're doing to partners. You might not need to develop your own marketing department if you get to know another small business that is really good at marketing and, and they're happy to do that for you for, for a sensible commercial arrangement. So finally, be a mammal. Learn the lesson from 65 and a half million years ago. We all want to be mammals. We want to be the ones that survive and evolve and prosper. We want to be the ones that become the dominant species. And don't ever think that it makes sense to copy being a dinosaur. They're not the ones that are going to inherit the, 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 the economy, as it sounds. So this is actually an amazing time to be doing a startup. The times when everything's falling apart, when all the rules are changing, those are the times with the biggest opportunities. But they're opportunities that reward people who are ambitious and think about things in a completely different way. When the rules change, the people who win are the people who write the new rules. So, don't be put off by the scary economy. Just look at it as a challenge and an opportunity to do amazing things. So good luck to all of you. We've got about 10 minutes for questions, I think. OK, got it. Oh, at the back. Hi. Hi. My name is Ulash, and uh, I wonder, since you already uh, funded one of your projects by crowdsour uh, crowdfunding what would be the best uh, and effective ways that we can also fund our ideas or projects by uh, crowdfunding thank you so there are several elements like crowdfunding is not easy like uh, that's the first thing i say it's a lot of work um, and it all rests on communication and network so the starting point, it's not something that, that kind of a random public is going to come to you. You start with your network. So everybody that you know, 
and everybody that they know and everybody that your team and your family and your friends know, that's your audience. So first of all, work out your proposition, work out the way to communicate it that a stranger can understand in 30 seconds and that there's, that there's some element in it that's going to really interest or excite them, that they're going to remember. And then uh, just start meeting people, speaking to people. So people think of crowdfunding as this web-based stuff. A lot of it is actually about face-to-face -face, uh, conversations. You just need to meet loads and loads of people and then get every person you speak to to introduce you to three more people and get them to introduce you to three more people. If you can get some media coverage in the mainstream press about your project that is saying that you're crowd, crowdfunding it as well, that's really valuable. In England, you can never go out to the public and say, I'm raising money, uh, it's illegal. So if you can get a journalist to say that, that's fine. This is one of the things that, that we learned through our lawyer. So it, it's hard work, but it's all, if you get the proposition right so that people can understand it, and then you work really hard putting it through your network and, and find a platform that might be Kickstarter or Cedars or, or Crowdcube that, 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 makes it, that automates the process of people making commitments, then you're away. And, and, and that's really, really work at it. It's going to be a full-time job for, for a month or two. Right, thank you. Another question. Oh, over there. So um, I work at a startup that's based in San Francisco. And San Francisco is incredibly expensive as a city to live in. So we're looking to crowdfund a bond in a couple months, and we're debating right now whether or not we should take the money that we raise and move overseas to Indonesia, uh, Eastern Europe, a country where the capital costs of running a team are much, much lo lower, and we can plow more into the actual business itself. Our major concern, though, is if we do that, we completely disconnect from our network. Being in a house in the middle of Indonesia, it sounds great. We'll get a lot of work done, but nobody will know what we're doing. So, I think it's a great idea. Like when, when I was doing the prototype for trampoline systems, I actually raised a grant to do that, um, but it was a tiny grant. Uh, and I, I was living in London at the time. It was clear I couldn't do it. So, I moved to an island in the Mediterranean, and I lived there for two years to do the prototype. And, and one of my co-founders moved to an island on the Norwegian coast. And, and like that's how, how we did it. And we weren't that wasn't a time when we were actively marketing, uh, but it meant that we could do that development stage. Now, somebody just yesterday, I can't remember who, but somebody was telling me about a business where the whole core team was essentially being nomadic. They'd started in, in San Francisco, then they moved to, to London, then they moved to Hong Kong, then they moved to Tel Aviv, and they're just moving around. And it's a really new way of doing things, right? And they're building up a community every place they go. Now, there is a trade-off because obviously if you're like I'm in I'm in Shoreditch, I've been in Shoreditch now for nine years, and that's an amazing community. And and so like every time you step outside the door, you're meeting people who are doing something relevant. You go and live in Indonesia in the middle of a forest, that's not going to happen. So you might need to look at other ways to be actively building your community using social media and so forth. But totally reducing your costs is a great, great thing to do. And San Francisco is crazily expensive, London's crazily expensive. Like, for, for certain businesses, like, and, and tell friends of mine to just get out of London, live somewhere cheaper, and just come in once a month or something. So I, I would totally encourage you to look at alternative locations. Another question. Over here. Hi, my name is Stefan. And uh, first of all, why don't you come to Berlin? I mean, it's very cheap here, and here's <laughs> another a great community to build up. And uh, second, thanks Charles for your inspiring speech. And uh, I have a question concerning some early part that you said your first, the first VC you raised money from was actually going bankrupt afterwards? Is no, they didn't go bankrupt. But, but what they, happened to the money? It was a hedge fund. Oh no, so we kept the money. <laughs> but we okay. were expecting a whole lot more money from them. We, we didn't get that. Um, and, and this is a kind of, like, with the original uh, term sheet they gave us, they actually had a clause that would have allowed them to take back the money if they wanted. Okay. So, so I threw a fit at that and made them take it out, thank, thank goodness. So we kept the money, um, but it meant that 
that we didn't get the, 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 the B round or the C round right. that we were assuming we were going to have. So I learned my lesson from that. So have you raised money from BC? No, no, no. Are you planning to? I don't know. Possibly. Hopefully. <laughs> well, Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Any more? Okay, well, I think the time's just about up. Oh, we do have one more. Time for one more. Actually, uh, I lost the first part of your presentation, and we have got a, a funding from an investment from a business angel in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am really curious what you were just saying. Like, so what has happened that after they go to bankruptcy, what has happened with the percentage? I don't know if there was the partnership between this VC or oh, how so, the. Like I say, um, I will put all of these slides up on SlideShare later today. So if you note down uh, my Twitter ID, I'll put out the link there. But just very briefly, like started off raising money from a VC. Um, they withdrew from the market because they were actually a hedge fund. And they, they, they started losing a lot of money and decided just to focus on their core business. Um, I then raised half a million pounds in 2009 through equity crowdfunding. Um, and it's kind of completely changed the way that I look. Working with angel investors is fantastic. I really love working with private investors. So I, you've, done, you've done a great thing there. So best of luck to you. So any, anytime you're visiting London, do come and visit the Trampery. I'd be delighted to see you. Best of luck with your ventures. Enjoy the last day and a half of Campus Party. And see you again.